following interview is with Michael J. Nunsfield. Dr. Nunsfield is a senior curator at the Space History Division of the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum and former chair of the department. An expert in aeronautics and space, Dr. Nunsfield has worked as a professor in upstate New York. He joins the generation senior researcher Alban Gulli for our upcoming Worldview episode on the militarization of space. This series is promoting the charity Tab for a Cause. If you're interested in supporting solutions to international issues with a simple Chrome extension, please click the link in the video description. So I would definitely want to mention that this interview is part of the Worldview documentary episode on the weaponization of space, and that can be found in the description of the video. And first and foremost, I want to definitely uh, provide an introduction for our viewers and our listeners uh, to you, Dr. Neufeld. Uh, so Dr. Michael J. Neufeld is a senior curator at the Space History Department. He served as chair of the department from 2007 to 2011. He has received degrees from the University of Calgary and University of British Columbia before getting a PhD in modern history from Johns Hopkins University in 1984. Dr. Neufeld has written many scholarly articles and four books, uh, notably Von Braun, Dreamer of Space Engineer War, War in 2007, which won three awards, and Space Flight, a Concise History in 2018. He has appeared in numerous television and radio programs, particularly regarding NASA's Sea Rocket program, Werner Von Braun, and the U.S. space program in the 1960s. So we definitely want to uh, thank you for joining us and your expertise oh. on arriving this particular and subject. So thank you. Sure. Thank you. No problem. So I definitely want to start with the first question. Um, and it, it was, it, it's related to uh, some of the, in the most recent article that you're uh, about to post and publish. Um, the first question is really just, who is Werner von Braun and what is its significance to space operations? Well, uh, Werner von Braun, so to use the German pronunciation, um, was a German and then American rocket engineer, uh, one of the most important rocket engineers of the 20th century. He was the uh, project director of the uh, German Army rocket program that led to the V-2 ballistic missile in World War II. Um, and of course, I've written extensively about his Nazi question and the Nazi involvement of him, which is another subject altogether. He then came to the United States, uh, worked for the U.S. Army for 15 years, developing uh, early on crews and ballistic missiles. Um, in the late 50s, he transitioned uh, to working for NASA, officially starting at, as a NASA, the leader of the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center uh, in 1960 in Huntsville, Alabama, and uh, was in NASA as the director of the center that built the launch or design, not built, the design the launch vehicles for the Apollo moon landing. So, so you know, and this, the last thing that's really important in this regard is that he was a big advocate for space travel in the 1950s, which was influential. He certainly had some military space ideas, uh, none of which really ever worked out, but uh, it was part of what he used to talk about in the 1950s before he got involved with NASA. That's, very, that's quite interesting. And I, def I definitely want to uh, push forward the, the timeline that we're trying to present here. And the next question is really just uh, about Sputnik. So how was, this, uh, how was the Sputnik satellite launch impactful for space race and geopolitics? Well, um, of course, the launch of Sputnik was, is the date most people use to say the start of the space race. You know, that's certainly the point at which the embarrassment of coming second resulted in the United States just, just spending much more money on space after Sputnik. Um, I argue, I have argued in a couple places that space has really began in 55 when each side announced that it was going to launch a satellite for the International Geophysical Year. But um, it, there's no doubt that Sputnik um, resulted in the U.S throwing more money at space travel, uh, perhaps if then if it, if, if it had come first with the first satellite. And of course, that, that fall of 1957, there were multiple embarrassments. So the United States lost out in the sense that first, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1 in October, then it launched Sputnik 2 with a dog, a much bigger satellite in November and December, the first US satellite attempt with Vanguard failed. And so the first American satellite didn't get launched until January 31st, 1958. So 
there was a sense early on that the United States was always behind, always being embarrassed and forced to catch up, which resulted, of course, in much more money being spent on space travel. And the public part that everybody knows about is the NASA program. NASA, of course, wasn't even created until about exactly one year after Sputnik. But whereas simultaneously, there was also a military space program. And uh, much less obvious, mostly conducted in secret, um, and uh, has been dominated by the Air Force, but also on the, with the intelligence space program with the CIA. Interesting. So what would, how would you define the relationship between the Cold War and the space race? Well, um, you know, without the Cold War, there would be no space race. I mean, the incredible acceleration of space activity and space spending that came about as a result of the space race. And, and, if, and if it wasn't for the U.S.-Soviet competition, there is no way the United States would have thrown that much money at it, at space travel. Um, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned, there was a sense always of coming from behind and trying to catch up to the Soviet lead in the early space race which lasted until about the mid-60s, at which point the United States began to take over on the civilian side. In fact, on the military side, the United States was always first. But that was overshadowed by the fact they got the first satellite and the first you know, animal in, in orbit, and they got the first thing to hit the moon, and the first thing to photograph the far side of the moon, and then the first human in space, Yuri Gagarin, 1961, etc. So there was always a sense of being behind. And um, if there had been no Cold War, the United States would have entered space much more slowly. There's no doubt about it. And the Soviet Union, too, for that matter. And, and, and about, the, about the space race in relationship with the Cold War, how did that define or shift political views towards the space race at large? You know, it, 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 it's what made spending lots of money possible because, you know, both Democrats and Republicans um, agreed that uh, you know, we could not be behind in space, that we needed to match Soviet capabilities or even exceed them, which of course led most spectacularly to Kennedy's decision to go to the moon in 1961, um, uh, just for the sole purpose of showing the Soviets that we could catch up and pass them if possible, so, or at least be, remain competitive with them. So um, I've actually sort of lost track of what your original question was, I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. I, I was really just wanting to probe about the, how the space race and how the Cold War and that relationship shifted political views, particularly within mm -hmm. the United States. And you mentioned a little bit about spending, but how did that define po political uh, motivations? Uh, you know, I mean, I think, it didn't have an, a, a, an effect on the Cold War in some fundamental ideological sense, a sense that it changed minds. It certainly but it changed the willingness to spend money on both missile and space programs. Uh, 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 it, you know, it, that will was there, but, you know, as, we, as it appeared the United States was behind, that meant that it was much easier for advocates for military space programs or ICBMs or civilian space programs to say, we can't, we're, we're behind the Soviet Union. They're a mortal threat to the United States. We have to spend money on, you know, more money on ballistic missiles and space uh, than, than we would have anyway. Um, um, that's, you know, it, it overcame this reluctance, which was, you know, contained even within the president, Eisenhower, in the 1950s, uh, up to the beginning of 61. You know, um, and, um, Eisenhower was a fiscal conservative. He was kind of a, 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 um, a, a uh, kind of Republican that doesn't exist anymore, you know, sort of a, a centrist, but uh, uh, um, a fiscal conservative who didn't want to expand the government because he thought it was a threat to the American way of life. Uh, but, um, you know, he was kind of forced by events to, um, to spend more. Uh, and the fact that he seemed like he was dragging his feet, whether that was fair or not, and uh, there's certainly the question about, if, is it fair? Uh, they look like he's dragging his feet 
became uh, an issue in the 1960 election. So, you know, Nixon and, and Kennedy ran. Kennedy was able to criticize uh, the, uh, you know, Eisenhower-Nixon administration for being behind in missiles in space and leaving us, our, us threatened with nuclear attack or, you know, with, with looking or, you know, a, a very critical part of this whole story, too, it's easy to rem- forget is that also the international relations dimension of the space race, the early space race. It took place in the context of the decolonization of Africa and Asia. Uh, it took place at a time when many new nations were, cut, were arising from the colonies that were breaking away from the most, most from mostly from Britain and France. Um, these new governments were pawns and or, you know, uh, prizes in the Cold War struggle between the Soviet Union and the United States. And the image of the Soviet Union was in, improved and increased because of its space successes. So, you know, you look out there and you see the Soviet Union leading in space and, and it, it makes the uh, communist or socialist system look superior to capitalism. Because, well, they're making these great technological strides. You know, we need, maybe, maybe we should think about having a socialist economy rather than a capitalist economy in, the, in our new country, many of them, a lot of them in Africa. Uh, so uh, part of the concern of the Eisenhower administration and then also by the Democrats in Congress was we want to make sure the United States looks good internationally and one way we can do that is by having a civil space program, establishing NASA to run a civil space program where we have the more peaceful and scientific or uh, 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 space program house front and center, and that will influence nations to think of the United States as not technologically behind the Soviet Union. That's quite insightful. I, I want to probe a little bit about uh, one, uh, just the development of programs. And one. Uh, I found particularly in some of your works was uh, the mentioning of, a, of the Corona program. And can you walk us through what the Corona program is and its significance? Right. So Corona was the United States' first photo intelligence satellite program. Uh, and uh, as I've written, you know, uh, and based on a lot of other very fundamental work by other scholars, they, uh, the idea of a reconnaissance satellite was there right from the end of World War II. Uh, it right uh, early on, uh, um, like RAN, which was started out as a think tank for the Air Force, um, said, this is a major thing we can do with a satellite. We can put a camera over the Soviet Union or the Soviet bloc countries and photograph them. Uh, and that's a particular strategic problem with the United States because of the difficulty of penetrating the Soviet bloc with regular agents, uh, with human agents, uh, with uh, uh, and um, you know, in many ways, the Soviet Union, Soviet bloc was um, was was very difficult to access and very difficult to understand what was really going on. It's a huge landmass and you could spy on the outer reaches of the Soviet Union, but it was almost impossible to get to the interior and see what was really going on. So Corona rose as an emergency program right after Sputnik, because all the earlier Air Force satellite projects for reconnaissance were still fairly theoretical and not much money had been spent on them. And, uh, and you know, I could go on about the technologies involved, but bottom line was the corona was based on film return you would have a camera take pictures on film and then the film would be put into a re-entry vehicle and the so-called bucket you know which was inside the re-entry vehicle would come down through the atmosphere and then it would be on a parachute and usually an airplane would go out and snag the parachute and reel in the bucket with the film and the film was then brought back to be deposited, bought back to be processed in the United States. This was at a stage which electronic imaging was so primitive, it just could not be made to work um, uh, with the kind of resolution you needed. So the problem was resolution. You know, there were television-based systems and the Air Force experimented with those, 
but they, the, the ground resolution was poor. And so the only way we could get a high resolution image, let's say, of a Soviet ICBM base was to take a film and then return the film to Earth and develop it. Um, and Corona was launched as a kind of emergency program after Sputnik. It was based on the same model as the U-2 aircraft, which was essentially a precursor. You know, the U-2 was a stopgap measure to create an airplane that could fly so high it could overfly the Soviet Union and photograph it from 70,000 feet. And that worked until Francis Gary Powers was shot down on May 19, 1960. You know, which exposed the U-2 program and, uh, and what it really was and exposed the, 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 the spying on the Soviet Union, which was very limited but helpful that had been done with U-2 aircraft. And so the Corona satellite came along essentially as the replacement for the U-2. And um, it took images uh, of, the, of the Soviet Union, which established very rapidly that the so-called missile gap, which... Kennedy himself had made something of in the 1960 election, didn't exist. In fact, it was the opposite. We discovered rapidly that we had many more long-range missiles than the Soviets did. The Soviets were had a huge bluff going, saying we have thousands of missiles, and they didn't, because they were, you know, they were still struggling to make their rockets work. Oh, that's, that's very interesting. I mean, and, and you've definitely been alluding to the different motivations for just the space program development. And I just want to ask, like, how did the United States effectively establish three of them? You know, we all know about NASA, but there's also the USAF and the NRO. So can you speak on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, again, based on what others have said, there are really three space programs that the United States has, and the public only focuses on one. In fact, the public virtually only focuses on the human space program, you know, as if that's the only thing that matters. Uh, and in fact, at the very outset of the space race, then you have, uh, uh, it took two or three years, but by 1960, it's it sorted itself out pretty much that the, um, NASA ran most of the civilian program. The Air Force ran many of the military space programs. And then a separate um, organization, which was created in 1961, the National Reconnaissance Office, which is super secret. Even the name was secret until the 1990s. It did not, officially did not exist. Like, 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 like for so many years, the National Security Agency officially did not exist. Um, the National Reconnaissance Office was established essentially to extend the Corona program's model, which was a, 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 a um, joint CIA military program. And so the NRO was the, or a space agency responsible for building reconnaissance satellites. Uh, the Air Force launched them and you know, other agencies were, took responsibility, notably the CIA, for processing the images. And there's also signal intelligence. So it's not just taking pictures, but also, you know, having satellites passing over the Soviet Union and recording the signals or communications and then trying to process that material. The Navy started that, but, it, you know, it obviously had several agencies involved. So you have these three different space programs, you know, one of which is obvious, NASA, one of which is known, the Air Force, and one of which was totally black, basically, the intelligence program, NRO. And, and how, how is the NRO, or is there a relationship between the NRO and the birth of the GPS? And, you know, how did the space program development develop uh, GPS? Yeah, if, if GPS is not connected to NRO because NRO is, is solely focused on this intelligence mission. Um, uh, GPS arises, well, GPS is run by the Air Force uh, mm -hmm. and may in the future be run by the Space Force since the Space Force effectively is just the, at this point, is just the space parts of the Air Force separated out. But um, GPS goes back to to um, uh, uh, navigation satellite system that was originally established by the Navy. So mm -hmm. in the 1960s, the Navy created a, a navigation satellite system called Transit. And it was 
basically for ballistic missile submarines. I mean, that was its most important uh, uh, purpose, was ballistic missile submarines. You know, that, that a ballistic missile submarine can launch against the Soviet Union from the middle of the ocean, but if it has no idea where it is, it's going to be very hard, you know, no accurate, no, no highly accurate idea of its exact geographical position. It's going to be very hard to hit any target in the Soviet Union uh, or the Soviet bloc in the case of a nuclear war. So, so the transit system that the Navy established is basically to give uh, a, a submarines, but we also surface ships, accurate location of their position. Well, yeah, you know, to make a long, complicated story short, and it's not something I'm super expert on, but um, uh, uh, in the 1970s, there were competing ideas for a, a, um, a navigation satellite system in the U.S. military. The decision was made to focus that on the Air Force, and GPS is essentially taking both Navy and Air Force technology developments to, uh, and a new technology, it ran, run on a different principle than, than transit, uh, uh, to create a single unified uh, U.S. Armed Forces navigation satellite system, which is the global positioning system. So the global positioning system then begins in the later 80s to put satellites into space to essentially Essentially, they are atomic clocks in orbit, and those atomic clocks give extremely precise time. And if you triangulate on those, uh, those on at least three satellites, and you know where they, and they broad, essentially they broadcast information that, that that helps you helps any GPS system decipher where exactly you are on the ground or on the surface or even above the surface. It's three-dimensional. Well, it would also show an airplane altitude, for example. Um, um, well, that just turned out to be a huge success for the military, but it was also so useful for civilian purposes that it became ubiquitous as it is now completely ubiquitous in our daily life. Oh, that's quite respectful. And, and you mentioned about the 1980s, and, I, and you know, it also serves a, a key moment in, in the space history and space development. And I really want to ask about um, explaining uh, Ronald Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative, also also known mm -hmm. as Star Wars, and really uh, shed some light into it, that's what it is. Right. So um, let me just preface that by saying, you know, as I've written about it in the publication I sent you and, and that's about to come out, the Cold War essentially produced a very important de facto regime, which was that we could militarize space but not weaponize it, that we wouldn't station weapons in space or build large systems for shooting down other people's satellites. Um, and that, that was effectively a de facto evolution of the situation after the very first years of the space race when U.S. and Soviet Union even exploded nuclear weapons in space on tests. Um, after the test ban treaty, you know, uh, at, in 1963, um, banned a nuclear weapons tests in space, and the both sides had established reconnaissance satellite systems. There evolved the de facto regime where both sides decided they were better off not starting a space war. And so uh, there was, so although, you know, that that was tested in the 70s and 80s by the Soviet Union, and also then later the United States developing anti-satellite weapons, that is weapons to shoot down the other side satellites, um, they were only tested in very limited ways, and we never got into a situation where the whole regime fell apart where each side decided they needed to launch an arms race in space and station weapons in space or build up our ground based systems to shoot down satellites. So then, but in the 1980s, as when President Reagan um, uh, was president, he was pretty much obsessed with the idea that we needed to uh, abolish nuclear weapons or make them impossible to use. And I mean, he had a point at, at, you know, that, you know, the reality of nuclear deterrence was and still is today is basically if 
you know, the other side attacks us, we shoot back, and the result is a global nuclear holocaust. And so Reagan wanted to find a way out of that, and he was sold the idea that if you put laser battle stations in orbit, you might be able to shoot down Soviet warheads or shoot down Soviet missiles before they release their warheads. You know, you combine, you create a whole anti-missile system where you would have both have orbiting stations for shooting down Soviet missiles or other countries' missiles and ground-based systems to try to intercept the warheads that got through that we could change the nature of, you know, the, the strategic nuclear stalemate. Um, but that was viewed as incredibly threatening. When he made a speech in 1983 talking about, you know, the U.S. military is going to examine this whole idea of a strategic defense, strategic defense initiative, uh, it set off a huge firestorm of criticism inside the United States. It it made this, the, this relationship with the Soviet Union more difficult. Um, and it was an enormous controversy for several years in the mid-1980s, one that I followed closely at the time. And then it sort of petered out because the Cold War, you know, the Cold War petered out in the end of the 80s with uh, Gorbachev and Reagan. And, uh, and we have one remnant of that whole period, which is there's a very limited ground-based anti-missile defense based in Alaska. <laughs> and we have a few interceptors that might, if we were lucky, shoot down a warhead, you know, uh, uh, from North Korea. But that's the only thing that ever came out of all that. Well, that's, that's quite interesting. And, and I, I guess an offshoot of, 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 of the Reagan's uh, uh, Star Wars initiative really um, is the brilliant Preble's program. You know, what is it? How did it work in it? And why was it canceled? Well, so-called Star Wars, the uh, SDI evolved in the course of the 80s. These initial ideas, which uh, people like the you know, famous nuclear scientist Edward Teller had sold to Reagan, uh, the laser battle stations all proved to be far too utopian, you know, so too much too difficult. Uh, so the military got interested in the idea of so-called kinetic uh, impactors. So rather, it, the, it, during, the, during the 1960s, the United States developed an anti-ballistic missile system, and the Soviets developed an anti-ballistic missile system based on missiles with nuclear warheads. And basically, you would fire a missile with a nuclear warhead at the incoming warheads, and you would disable or vaporize them. Uh, um, but the United States abandoned its system quickly because it felt like it was going to be pretty ineffective. Um, so when we get to the, to the 80s, the idea is rather than having to launch a whole nuclear warhead and sort of blunderbuss approach and try to you know, knock things out of the sky with a massive explosion and radiation, why don't we have these impactors just impact the other warhead, you know, physically? So, you know, if you just run a rock into something traveling 15,000 miles an hour, it, you know, it's going to disintegrate and, uh, both, both the impactor and the warhead. So, um, so that was the basis for the new generation of anti-ballistic missile weapons. Both the ground-based ones was having so-called smart rocks. At some point, somebody said, you know, we don't need smart rocks. We need brilliant pebbles. We need even smaller impactors that are more, um, better automated, better computerized. I mean, it's an extremely hard technological problem to shoot down a warhead that may be training 15,000 miles an hour and your projectile may be traveling something on that order or something close to it with a, you know, with a head-on approach speeds of 20, 30,000 miles per hour. Your guidance system has to be extremely accurate if you're going to physically hit that other object. And it's a street, it remains an extraordinarily difficult technological problem. And so brilliant pebbles were the idea that you would have these satellites in orbit, which would have a whole bunch of these small um, impactor you know, devices. You know, you would have a satellite which would, which would fire off a whole bunch of these small rockets with these, 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 these uh, uh, war, these, I call them a warhead, but they don't have any explosive. They just these 
these impactors would 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 steer themselves to try to run into a physical object. And so that was the late stage of Star Wars when get away from the you know science fictionish laser you know laser weapons and and more and it just you've got to hit those warheads with a with a, with an object. The problem always was that you know when you launch a warhead you can also when you when the when the missile ICBM deploys several warheads it can also deploy a bunch of uh, of um, uh, uh, distractions, again, it, like balloon, you, can, you, can, you, can, uh, you know, balloons and things that look like warheads, uh, chaff, whatever. You create a cloud of stuff, and it's not clear what's the warhead and what's just this, you know, penetration aids as they call them. So, you know, it remains incredibly difficult because you know there's the ways to spoof the spoof or distract or you know t absorb the defenses um, um, and, and being a, I mean, unable to shoot down what you want to shoot down and so that in spite of all your efforts some of the warheads would get through and you know just to finish up that thought this became the major problem with so-called Star Wars in the later 80s you know because there because a lot of people argued you know you could spend you know, billions and billions and billions on this, and yet somehow some warheads will always get through, which means the death of millions of Americans. So, you know, what's the point of spending all that money if you're not going to actually change the strategic equation in any significant way? No, no, that, that, that's absolutely true. So, and I guess maybe a step forward was the Brilliant Eyes program, and you know, how did that develop into the space based infrared system? Well, I mean, you know, the, part of the, what you need to, in order to be able to um, see where those warheads are coming from, you need to be able to see everything coming. So, you know, of course, this goes back partly to the, you know, an other, other system, which was the missile, uh, missile early warning system that the United States developed. Uh, and... Um, uh, the uh, de de defense support system, you know, which was a bland name for infrared satellites up in geostationary orbit, watching the Soviet Union, the Pacific, and the Atlantic for missile launches, and we still have that, you know, in a new version uh, um, for watching for launches. Your problem with this is that, you know, you it's easy to detect a rocket launch because of the the, the bright infrared signature of a rocket motors firing as it leaves the ground and as it extends on its trajectory into orbit or into or throwing a warhead to the other side of the world. The problem was is that once that uh, boost phase is over and the missile releases its warheads, you know, and whatever uh, distractions penetration aids it's, it's releasing, it's really hard, as I said, to determine what is an actual warhead and what is what is just what is just a uh, you know a false signal or or a, uh, or a, a distraction so um, you need better um, missile early warning to try to detect you know these systems um, so that you can see what's you know as they're deployed that's one challenge um, and another challenge became people said, well, what we really need to do is to shoot down the missiles in the, the boost phase. You know, when we get either, when there's just one object, a rocket, and we can see the signature of it of, of its rocket motors burning, we should shoot down the missile at an early phase. But that's just incredibly difficult because it requires incredible reaction time. You know, the missiles burn for five minutes, maybe, and then and then then they release their warheads, and uh, and you make a decision by the United States that then within five minutes to try to shoot down missiles that are already on the way. It's almost impossible. But I, I guess I must say I'm not super expert on brilliant eyes. I haven't paid careful attention to it, but um, at least the space, you know, the supposed called space based. Esber is a space-based infrared um, uh, satellite system.
which is the, you know, the newer generation of these uh, missile early warning satellites. No, of course, of course. No, it, it, nonetheless, this is very insightful. Um, um, and if you want to uh, follow up with a uh, early, earlier point, really talking about uh, going back to like Reagan Star Wars initiatives and the development of laser weapons, really hypothetically, um, what were directed energy weapons in general, and you know, and how how have they manifested themselves today? And is, is there any progress in developing such weapons? Yeah, well, of course, a directed energy weapon is effectively a laser is the easiest one that everyone understands because it, you know, it's some limited ways in everyday life, you know, from department store, uh, grocery store scanner, and everything else. But you know, it's it's shooting a beam of energy at something. Now, of course, there was also discussion of using particle beams, essentially having effectively large part, you know, like a, like a nuclear accelerator used for experiments, and have it accelerate a beam of protons or or, uh, or electrons at a target. So is it, you know, is it a high powered light, you know, uh, uh, that would essentially burn a hole into something or would you, or could you direct a beam of protons, let's say, you know, to, to irradiate something and destroy its functioning? Um, these were all ideas that were, you know, actively discussed during Star Wars, uh, the SDI period. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the United States military invests a lot of money in them, and so far, it hasn't amounted to anything, you know. There was a program, there was a whole um, um, set, there's a huge 747, which had a laser on it, which the U.S. tested. Uh, and, the, you know, the, the energetics of this is very difficult. How do you create that much energy? How do you focus that much energy? Uh, it you know, essentially, although it's, you know, part of every sci-fi image of the future, space war, you know, all this laser, laser is shooting at each other, it remains technologically still very difficult. And we're not there anywhere. We're not really anywhere close to being able to make that usable. Of course, of course. Um, I definitely want to, uh, you know, shift the focus because we've been talking about the weapons development and the history of the of, uh, weaponization in space in general. But I also want to really talk about um, the history and impact of space treaties. And if you can know, if you could mm -hmm. speak upon some notable ones uh, for the sake of the audience and listeners. Right. Well, I mean, uh, uh, the first I think that was really important was the Test Ban Treaty of 1963, which was, of course, uh, something that had been discussed since the late 50s, but was directly motivated by the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, the near, the, the closest problem we ever came to a nuclear war. And um, the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty uh, explicitly ruled out tests in space, which is, I mentioned earlier, had been actually done in 1961, 62 by, or even early in 98 by the United States. So um, by the, that was really important as a starter. The uh, UN Outer Space Treaty of 1967 um, also uh, bans all weapons of mass destruction in space. Um, and so um, effectively banning nuclear weapons from orbit and, and, and beyond out to the moon and whatever Although, you know, any military activity beyond essentially orbits around the Earth still remains a very hypothetical. Um, and I suppose that would also, by definition, I'll rule out kind of dropping chemical weapons or biological weapons uh, from space. So, you know, that, that, is, that sort of uh, anchored in the, um, the non-weaponization of space. Now, the, the treaty does not say that you can, that against deploying a, uh, you know, high explosive or, um, uh, you know, or even a kinetic weapon like I described with the missile defense, you know, which is just a, 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 an object that's uh, without any explosive on it, which you use to ram and destroy something else. So in theory, you know, any satellite weapons are not banned. And... The same is true of shooting down a satellite from the ground, an anti-missile 
an anti-missile system on the ground, which is used to shoot down warheads, could also be used to shoot down things in low Earth orbit. So um, those things were not banned, but in general, the side said, we're better off not getting into an arms race over deploying anti-satellite weapons. Um, uh, it, it would look shaky at times because the Soviets did actually test a number of times an anti-satellite weapon where they would, you know, essentially put something in orbit and then they put another thing in orbit to chase it down and explode near it. Some, usually they would explode, they would, they would rendezvous with the, uh, with the target and then they would move away and explode the warhead just, just to not destroy the target. But um, that, I mean, that's the biggest problem that we are facing now is the question of, you know, are we facing a new wave of anti-satellite weapons from China and Russia, and what do we do about it? Um, the, 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 with the end of the Cold War, the kind of de facto regime of militarization but not weaponization of space uh, reasserted itself, and that's effectively the regime we're still in. But, you know, growing use of Satellites by all sides and growing experiments for anti-satellite weapons, you know, by the Chinese and the Russians, and, uh, and I guess even the Indians have tested something, means that, you know, we're now in a situation where deploying weapons to shoot down things in space is becoming more, more real again, or a, a bigger threat. No, it's quite interesting. And I definitely want to ask about just the effect what would the what's the effectiveness of arms race um, arms race treaties in part as it relates to space? You know how how has that proven effective over the years? Well, I mean, of course, um, the arms control treaties um, limited the mostly the deployment of ground based systems. So there was a you know there was anti ballistic missile and there was start and um, uh, now I'm, and I'm blanking on the acronym for the current regime between the United States and Russia, which still was in effect. But all these treaties were, were fundamentally about limiting ground-based missiles. Uh, and, 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 they also, um, and they were based on the fact that both sides had reconnaissance satellites. And so we could see what they had, they could see what we had, and therefore you know, you could have a treaty. This was, now, at the very end of the Cold War, you know, we, the first time we had treaties that begin to have ground-based inspections where ground teams actually go into each other's countries with the Russians and the United States. Uh, and that still exists in some limited form, you know, and notably with the um, intermediate uh, um, missile, intermediate range missile treaty of, uh, what was it? 87, I'm trying to forget now, I mean, I've forgotten the exact date. You had ground-based inspections, but fundamentally we needed those satellite systems to have arms control. And so arms control agreements, although they were not explicitly about space, were predicated upon the fact that you would have space-based assets to spy on each other. And that also therefore increased the motivation to use those systems, but not to threaten the other side systems, <laughs> you know, because, you know, that would destabilize, you could destabilize the arms race, you know. Uh, these arms control treaties in the, uh, in the 70s were more about, as someone said, ground rules for the arms race rather than, than really limiting weapons. But the later treaties, uh, you know, from the end of the 80s into the 90s, actually reduced nuclear weapons by significant numbers. We have significantly fewer uh, missiles and bomber warheads deployed on both sides, although it's still way more than we should have. Um, we actually reduced nuclear weapons in the wake of the Cold, uh, the end of the Cold War. So um, that's another regime that you know, is threatening to fall apart. Uh, uh, as you know, the uh, U.S. withdrew from the um, anti-ballistic missile treaty because um, uh, it said the Russians were violating it. And the uh, question now is, of course, whether well, some of these other uh, 
arms control treaties will also hold up in the future or whether they could, you know, we can reassert their value or supplement them is a good, is a really important question. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I definitely want to touch on this uh, important use of it. And I think it's been uh, permeating throughout your responses and the questions is really just the history of dual use technology in space and how that relates to the overall space development. Right. I mean, you know, dual use was essentially invented as a term for these kind of rocket and space technologies because it was pretty obvious, you know, at the beginning of the space race, you could use an ICBM to launch a warhead or you could use it to launch a satellite because throwing a warhead to the other side of the planet um, is not much short of the velocity you need to put something in orbit. And all you have to do is put a smaller payload on the end of your missile and it would go into orbit rather than landing on the far side of the world. So, so from the outset, you know, the ballistic missile was clearly a dual use technology. You could put peaceful or scientific or at least, um, you know, non-weaponized military objects in space, or you could launch warheads. Um, of course, it applied, of course, you know, across a whole range of technologies and aircraft is obviously another one. You know, from the beginning, it's both a military and civilian object. So um, clearly dual use is a reality we face and it, and it, and it affects armed control agreements and so forth because, you know, you want to limit, if you want to limit weapons, you know, can you limit the technologies to get them there like rockets you know, aircraft? Uh, if you also want to use those rockets and aircraft to do civilian or scientific or other purposes. That's quite interesting. That's quite interesting. And I, um, and I definitely want to probe a little bit more into what you mentioned uh, a little bit earlier about some other, other powers that are rising in terms of space development, no, notably China. And I, I wonder if you could speak on uh, their, the last 50 years of their interest in space and how it's, and how it's trending towards now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I have to say right off, I'm not an expert on China, so I'm a, I read the news and I pay attention to what's going on. But, um, you know, it's, it's clear the Chinese have had a desire to assert themselves as a, a great power on the same plane as the U.S. and Russia. Uh, and uh, part of the way it's done that is, and especially since the 90s, is to develop um, both um, non-military or at least non uh, space programs that don't have explicitly military intent like the human space program, as well as developing the capability to de deploy missiles and, and, and anti-satellite weapons. Uh, so it has tested an anti-satellite weapon, created an enormous controversy with it shooting down an old weather satellite it had in, I think, 2007, somewhere around there, uh, created a cloud of debris, you know, which was a major problem because, in, as I've written in my book, Space Body Concise History, you know, our biggest threat in many ways to the future use of at least low Earth orbit in particular is, you know, if we cluttered up with so much debris, at some point it may become difficult or impossible to use some of these orbits which we use so much for our daily life. I mean, we don't even think about how embedded space is in our daily life. It's totally embedded in our daily life. We discussed GPS earlier, but there's navigations. I mean, there's communication satellites, which is the foundation of global TV. There is uh, 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 weather satellites, which is the foundation of early warning for hurricanes and everything else, and just even our daily weather forecasts. Uh, uh, you know, our understanding of global climate change is absolutely predicated on Earth science satellites or surveying the Earth. All of these systems could become threatened if we, you know, create space junk to the level which it becomes impossible to use some of these orbits. And so that's where anti-satellite weapons come in. And if you test them and create clouds of debris or worst case scenario, if you were to have a kind of space war where we started shooting down our satellites and they started shooting down their satellite they started shooting on we started shooting on their satellites the result would be would be so much debris in orbit that you know we might find it impossible to have any kind of system in those orbits um 
So the Chinese are interested in these, you know, weapons, and they see what everybody else sees, which is the United States is by far the most well-developed space power, that its whole military system has become dependent on satellite systems, you know, how do you, you know, operate a drone from the far side of the world? It's through a communication satellite, you know, and it's also using the net and, and the drone is also using a navigation system to know exactly where it is, communicate with the pilot who's sitting in a computer terminal in Nevada or somewhere. Uh, you know, so those systems all use communications and navigation satellites. And you weather satellites to understand what the weather over there. You know, you know, Afghanistan or Iraq or somewhere else is. Um, so, um, so we developed a whole spectrum of ammunitions or, or GPS guided. You know, so you can hit something pretty precisely now because you can put a kit on the bomb. Uh, you know, uh, steer by GPS to hit something. So, the Chinese and the Russians see that we completely integrated on space systems in the military and you know well what would one of their main moves in a war be it would be to you know probably take out try to take out some of our key space systems so to blind or hobble the u.s armed forces uh, and if you want to have this question to really just uh you know wrap up things and have you in, in your works in your books and in, in the upcoming articles as well like you've spoken mm -hmm. about really the through lines in terms of between space history, space development, and, you know, how it trends and re as it relates to our, our development globally and how it affects us on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you, if you have a couple words to say and a couple of comments as to how, what you see as trending, how you see us moving forward with our relationship to space. Well, as, as I mentioned, the, the, the whole planet as we have now configured it is very dependent on space systems. We have effectively occupied the space from geostationary orbit, 24 hour orbit at 22,300 miles on down. That whole zone around the earth is now used for space systems which support the earth. And we need to be sure that we can protect those systems, you know, and, uh, and stabilize their existence because it's so important to our daily life, to communications, to weather, to climate change, to military stability, you know, because just from the outset, reconnaissance of the other side has been critical for arms control, for, for strategic stability, because if we're not mystified about what capability they have, or they are not mystified by us, nobody is being run by fear about what the secret things we were hiding, or they were hiding. So we really need these space systems. And I think that you know, I mean, I'm, I can't speak about policy explicitly because I'm, you know, working at the Smithsonian and I'm basically a historian, but I, I would say that we need to, you know, be very careful not to threaten those critical systems. And the, the biggest threats are, are you know, space war, uh, uh, just war, just space junk, creating too much junk to go in, in low earth orbit and maybe even in geostationary orbit. To, to make those areas usable. And, um, and the third is a natural threat, basically, if we have to guard against uh, solar storms frying, you know, key things in, in, in space that we need to have. And so um, I'll say this much, we need to have an arm, we need to have an arms control strategy for negotiating with other countries. So the only answer to this potential new arms race in space is not, we have to build more weapons. You know, uh, we have to choose between building more weapons and building and making more treaties or maybe some combination of the two. But, but uh, there are options other than just getting into an arms race in space. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite insightful and it very much ties everything we discussed together. Once again, thank you, Dr. Nofeld. Um, for the audience and listeners, he is a senior curator in the Space History Department at National Air and Space Smithsonian. Um, mm -hmm. My name is, firstly, my name is Coach Agbuli, and this is from the Worldview. But we thank you so much for your time and so much for your insights. We appreciate it all. I enjoyed it. Very good questions. Thank you. I look of course. To the product. <laughs>